All right, so welcome. Today we are going to, it's the beginning of our webathon. The first major segment of our webathon is now officially beginning, and we are going to talk about the continuing adventures of Tom Bombadil. So, uh, this is, of course, something I've been referring to. This is this session is designed to be sort of a special bonus session, um, particularly intended for those who have been following along and are exploring the Lord of the Rings journey. Um, uh, well, amble perhaps is um, it is a journey, but uh, uh, not very uh, not at very high speeds. Anyway, um, so crawl, yeah, Okendor, that's probably best. Yes, uh, the the crawl that we are taking through the Lord of the Rings, wherein we have been talking about the last Tom the about Tom Bombadil for the last two or three months. So uh, <laughs> at least it seems that way. And during that time, I have several times alluded to the other the poems that Tolkien wrote, the poem upon which Tom Bombadil is based, and sort of from which he was drawn. And also, I've occasionally alluded to the sequel poem that he wrote later on. So we're going to be um, we're going to be looking at both of those things uh, today. And you guys are going to be shocked at the number of slides worth of poetry I'm going to get through today. I'm not going to do my normal thing where I look at every single line of the of the poetry because uh, you know I'll be here until midnight just for that. And I have a whole bunch of things that I'm going to do. And I'm totally staying on staying on schedule today. Um, so. Um, Anyway, okay, so this is what um, so this is what we're gonna do. Adventures of Tom Bombadil. So the Adventures of Tom Bombadil was published in the early '30s in the Oxford Magazine, which is essentially sort of a local literary journal connected to the university there. Um, that was published in the town. So it didn't achieve a really wide circulation. This never really became a famous poem or something like that. Um, but of course, it becomes immortalized in the Lord of the Rings itself, and um, uh, this is. Uh, this is, this is, so let's read through the poem. You will recognize the meter, of course. You will recognize several things. What are the opening lines of the original poem? Old Tom Bombadil was a merry fellow. Bright blue his jacket was, and his boots were yellow. Green were his girdle, and his breeches all of leather. He wore in his t tall hat a swan wing feather. He lived up under hill, where the withy windle ran from a grassy well down into the dingle. Old Tom in summertime walked about the meadows, gathering the buttercups, running after shadows, tickling the bumblebees that buzzed among the flowers, sitting by the waterside for hours upon hours. There his beard dangled long down into the water. Up came Goldberry, the river woman's daughter, pulled Tom's hanging hair. In he went a wallowing, under the water lilies, bubbling and a swallowing. All right, so we get the first, uh, uh, the first. Uh, encounter between Tom and Goldberry here. Now, um, JJ, yeah, I was noticing that line too, of course, in Exploring the Lord of the Rings. We spent a while talking about that peculiar sentence that ends up, down, underhill in the description of Tom's house. And although, JJ, you see that that actual phrasing isn't there, um, we see how it uh, he, he sort of gets in that direction, right? We can see this this line seems to be what that line would be, what, it, what it's based on, right? Notice he lived up underhill, um, so that 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 interesting kind of contrast of up and under, right? Uh, you think like, he lived down under hill, right? If it's under, you'd think he'd be down, right? But so that up down under hill concept is already uh, is already there, right? Or already near there. Um, okay, so yeah, exactly, uh, Tungle. He's still up and under at the same time, uh, which is interesting. Um, what do you notice? What do you notice about this? There's some pretty striking images, right? Yeah, Sam, I think the idea of him tickling bum, uh, bumblebees uh, is a little interesting. Um, JJ is a little disappointed that they're not Dumbledores, which I agree, Dumbledore is a cooler name for several reasons, right? But uh, um, but yes, and the Hummerhorns are right out, JJ. I'm sorry. Wrong poem for Hummerhorns. Um, so uh, what do we see him... What do we see him doing, right? What's the, what is, what is established about Tom Bombadil? What is, where, where do we begin in this poem, right? So we begin with his merriment and with his clothes. Now, it's interesting, right, that um, his, his, the, the, the description of his clothes comes off very differently in this context, right? When he is singing about his own clothes while dancing around his yard while the hobbits are in the parlor, right? Um, it's it's a little stranger, like somebody who runs around singing about his own clothes. This is um, at least a description, 
you know? Like we start off with a description and it's useful. Oh, hey, he's got a blue jacket and yellow boots, right? That's handy. Of course, we all knew that he would, right? But, uh, uh, but it just starts off in the, in, in, the, in the sense of description, which now isn't that interesting in thinking about what he goes around singing, right? Think about Tom Bombadil, hearing Tom Bombadil out in the yard, you know, taking care of the ponies and hearing him say this, old Tom Bombadil was a merry fellow, bright blue his jacket is and his boots are yellow. Apart from changing the tense, what Tom Bombadil is singing in the Fellowship of the Ring is the first two lines of this original poem, right? It almost makes you wonder, is the implication that like, they're hearing a snatch of it, but what he's doing is reciting this whole poem again and again, right? Um, they just hear him starting at the beginning <laughs> of this poem. So that maybe what we hear in Tom Bombadil is not him obsessing about his clothes, but rather him uh, uh, sort of rehashing this, uh, this original poem, in a sense, which is kind of, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, uh, yes, Ethelod, he does... Uh, uh, Ethelon asks where he gets his swan feather. Are there swans in the old forest? Uh, yeah, mm -hmm, there are. And we'll see him interact with a swan in the next poem. And he's not going to interact with a swan in this poem. But uh, Tolkien is going to work that into the story uh, later on. Exactly. Zed Turtles got it. Uh, very good. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Tom Bombadil's not a very... He's a, he's a merry fellow, but he's not a very busy fellow. Right. I mean, the one thing that we get very strikingly described here, um, we have a striking piece of non-action to begin our poem. Right. Um, not him running around and doing things, not even him like leaping on the hilltops or something like that. Um, we uh, we hear him walking about the meadows, gathering flowers, running after shadows. I don't know why he does that. If that's is that metaphorical? Is that literal? Um it, was he trying to? Is he pursuing the shadows, or is, is he just running amongst the shadows? How does that work? Tickling bumblebees, which sounds like fun, I guess. That sounds, seems what friendly, probably, right? Um, sitting around for hours, so he doesn't live a very active uh, or very dynamic life. Um, and yes, JJ, that's a really good point to recall. He's not married yet, right? This is bachelor Tom Bombadil, so he's he's not picking flowers as a gift, right, or to please his wife, uh, it, it's just just for fun, right? B presumably because he enjoys he enjoys buttercups. Now, Zed Turtle, I was thinking about that too. I don't think the shadows are whites, mostly because, um, the, so the, the shadows, I don't think we're, we're supposed to be thinking of Barrow Whites or something, because we're going to meet the Barrow Whites later on, and they'll be described in very different, in very different terms. Um, yeah. Now, careful about thinking of Tom here as uh, dilated in time as he is. We were just talking about that, of course, a couple days ago in Exploring the Lord of the Rings. We got to the passage where he talks about being eldest and how long he's been around. Remember, though, that's what happens after he gets placed in the Lord of the Rings, right? Um, we've, we're given... Imagine yourself as a, you know, a subscriber to the Oxford magazine, uh, you know, in the early 1930s, and you get this poem, you know, in your mailbox, right, drop through your mail slot. Um, so you're just reading it out of nowhere, and you don't know nothing about this, right? So there's, no, there's nothing that suggests so far in the poem that he's ancient, right, um, or, you know, that he's been around forever. So, Okay. That's right. Yeah, don't forget to enter the raffle if you haven't. Just in, in the Twitch chat, type exclamation point raffle and you'll be and you'll be ready. But Tungo, I agree. That is really um, that is a really good point. The buttercups and the shadows um, do seem to pair light and shadows there at the very beginning, uh, which is which is interesting. Yeah. Day and night thinking about day and night as we see him singing about um, in his poetry in The Lord of the Rings. Yeah. And then we get Goldberry. Right, so here's Goldberry, the river woman's daughter, and she pulls Tom by the beard into the river. Now, notice this is hardly her pouncing on him uh, as soon as he shows up, right? Because he's been like he sits there for hours upon hours, and I don't know that this happens um, like on a regular basis. <laughs> is this like a thing that happens? Is this just one day? You know, Gold, uh, Goldberry comes up, grabs him by the beard, and yanks him in the water. Um, but, uh, um, 
I don't know. Oh, so, so some of you are confused about the river. Um, he lived up under hill where the withy windle ran from a grassy well down into the dingle. Yes, he is by the source of the withy windle here. Yeah. Um, uh, that's different, right? It's a little different, but that's okay, right? Remember, don't try in your mind to reconcile this to the Fellowship of the Ring because that's doing it backwards, right? This just take what this is. The, the the way to think about that is why what's interesting about the fact that when he put it in the context of the old forest sequence in the Fellowship of the Ring, when he put Tom Bombadil there, why didn't he make a big deal about the source of the Withy Window being right by Tom's house? He could have done, right? It would fit in many ways. I saw some of you joking about the how Tom Bombadil is the center of the queerness of the forest, right? Uh, but he could have done that, and he didn't do that, right? So this is one of the things that's really fun about reading this original poem. The Fellowship of the Ring isn't going to help us understand this poem, right? or rather, if we think about it that way, we're doing it wrong, right? What Instead, what it can do um, is raise some really interesting questions, draw our attention to stuff uh, in the Fellowship of the Ring to, 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 to enable us to see what are some choices that Tolkien made, like things that he kept, things that he shifted away from, um, and how does he change those things in order to, you know, in ways that I think are really interesting. So in that way, it can really inform our reading of the Fellowship of the Ring. But it doesn't necessarily, uh, it doesn't necessarily, uh, um, you know, again, we can't use the Fellowship of the Ring stuff to, in, to, to help us understand this. Um, yeah, Tungo, I agree. The Withy Window is more a part of the forest in The Lord of the Rings. It's not, it's not connected as closely with Tom Bombadil himself, right? Um, okay. So he's uh, wallowing under the water lilies, notice, right? When uh, he is pulled into the water by Goldberry. All right, second slide, we're doing great. Hey, Tom Bom this is Goldberry speaking, of course. Hey, Tom Bombadil, whither are you going? Said fair Goldberry, bubbles you are blowing, frightening the finny fish and the brown water rat, startling the dab chicks and drowning your feather hat. You bring it back again, there's a pretty maiden, said Tom Bombadil. I do not care for waiting. Go down, sleep again, where the pools are shady, far below the willow roots, little water lady. Back to her mother's house in the deepest hollow swam young Goldberry, but Tom he would not follow. On, on knotted willow roots he sat in sunny weather, drying his yellow boots and his draggled feather. Okay, as soon as she pulls him in the water, she starts teasing him, right? Um, where are you going, Tom Bombadil, right? Why are you blowing bubbles and frightening the fish and the water rat, right? Why are you startling all the dab chicks? Uh, of course, because she pulled him under the water, right? So this is her fault. Uh, you know, why are you drowning your feather hat? Um, and notice what is revealed in that next line. You bring it back again. There's a pretty maiden. Why is his feather hat being drowned because she's grabbed it, right? She's all, she's, she, she's, she's captured his hat and is holding it prisoner, right? And he, you know, tells her to give it back again. I do not care for waiting, right? He didn't, uh, he didn't plan to do this. Um, Tarlonio uh, 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 thinks that she's flirting with this, this cute guy who's been hanging around her front door. Uh, this does sound, well, I don't know if I'll go so quite so far as flirtatious, could be interpreted that way. Certainly friendly, right? You can tell how friendly she is uh, based on how much of a hard time she's giving him, right? She's um, she's teasing him here, uh, and this is this is the way this is the way that this goes. It is playful, definitely, definitely, Stephanie, definitely playful. Um, and then what does he do? Okay, we have our first drawing. Cat Sass is the winner. Congratulations, Cat. Uh, so I want to, uh, to, again, for those of you who are watching, we're drawing door prizes. If you're watching on Twitter Live, by the way, join us on Twitch, twitch.tv slash SignumU. Then you can enter our drawings for door prizes and participate in our trivia contests later and everything. It's going to be awesome. Twitch.tv slash SignumU. Congratulations, Cat. Um, uh, so uh, what you do when you win 
Just send us an email. Send the email again, donate at signamu.org, and let us know which of these prizes you would like to have, right? You get your pick. Uh, and again, the first person, we only have one Edith Keeler action figure now. You know, come on. Uh, anyway, okay. So, Kat, congratulations. All right. Uh, now, Phil, you're absolutely right that this encounter is not as lethal as such encounters tend to be traditionally. We do see, um, uh, we do see Tolkien playing with a traditional motif. And for those of you who are not familiar with this, this isn't a fairy tale motif exactly so much as English folklore motif. Um, there were a number of rivers that have sort of folklore attached to them. Uh, and the folklore says that there is a, a female spirit who lives in that river and who will uh, grab, especially small children who wander down by the river unattended, right? Um, there are generations of English children who are told that if they wander down by the river by themselves, that Jenny Greenteeth might reach out and grab them and drag them in and drown them. So they should totally not do that if they don't want to be grabbed and dragged in and drowned, right? Um, so, you know, and these are uh, these are sort of fairy figures. Jenny Greenteeth, exactly, yeah. Uh, uh, wicked person, yes, exactly. That's, 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 that's exactly the... Uh, she's one of the most famous examples, really, of these kinds of spirits. So... Um, uh, so this is um, Tolkien's playing with that, right? But obviously he's not playing with it very seriously. Uh, um, it, it is a very, you know, Phil, as you say, a very sort of fun, non-lethal twist on that uh, on that tradition. And so Llama Lady, yes, exactly. She goes back to her mother's house, meaning meaning the river, which seems to be so. Her mother's house seems to be underwater. But of course, notice what, how does Tom get himself out of this situation, right? Not again that he seems to be in terrible danger, um, but he, uh, he gets out of this just by telling her to go to sleep. Go down, sleep again where the pools are shady, far beyond the willow roots, little water lady. Um, go sleep amongst the shady pool below the willow roots, right? That's where you should go. And she does. She goes and she goes to sleep presumably, right? Um, yeah, very good. Um, okay. So he's drawing his, he's trying to dry his draggled feather now. And now he has adventure number two. Up woke Willow Man, began upon his singing, sang Tom fast asleep under branches swinging. In a crack caught him tight, snicket closed together, trapped Tom Bombadil, coat and hat and feather. Ha, Tom Bombadil, what, be, sorry, this is Old Man Willow. Ha, Tom Bombadil, what be you a-thinking? Peeping inside my tree, watching me a-drinking, deep in my wooden house, tickling me with feather, dripping wet down my face like a rainy weather. You let me out again, old man Willow. I am stiff lying here. They're no sort of pillow. Your hard, crooked roots. Drink your river water. Go back to sleep again, like the river daughter. Willow man let him loose when he heard him speaking, locked fast his wooden house, muttering and creaking, whispering inside the tree. Out from Willow Dingle, Tom went walking on up the, wa up the withy window. Under the forest eaves, he sat a, wi he sat a while a-listening, on the boughs, piping birds were chirruping and whistling. Butterflies about his head went quivering and winking until gray clouds came up as the sun was sinking. So, Old Man Willow um, is the one who's caught, it, it catches Tom Bombadil, right? And of course, you'll recognize a lot of this imagery, even some of this language, like snick, the word snick, right? Uh, is uh, used to describe the the sound that makes you know when it when it when the crack closes shut uh, behind Pippin. Um, now, good Zach and Ethelot are both both noticing that Tom was asleep too. There seems to be sort of a general narcolepsy uh, in this in this area. He sends Goldberry to sleep, then he falls asleep. Right, Old Man Willow sings him to sleep. Um, this is the effect of the song of Old Man Willow, right? Why does he do it? What is he doing? Um, now, uh, Matthias, that's a really good question. Uh, we shouldn't take this for granted. Uh, Matthias asks, is Willow Man the tree here? 
Or does he live inside the tree? Right? Is it a man who, who, who resides within the willow tree? Or is it the tree himself? I think that this is the... Um, I think that this is the 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 tree itself, mostly because um, now. So, Matthias, that line, uh, uh, where is it? Peeping inside my tree, right? That that he just, just defines it as his tree would suggest that he's not the tree, right? That he's living inside the tree. But yeah, exactly, Zed Turtle. He does have he does have roots, right? Um, uh, deep in my wooden house. But again, the way that Tom Bombadil talks about him, um, you let me out again, old man Willow. Um, there are no sort of pillow, your hard crooked roots. Drink your river water, go back to sleep again. Um, Phil says maybe a male dryad. That's exactly the kind of thing that I'm thinking here, right? That he's, uh, there does seem to be a sort of implicit separation between like the being that Tom is talking to and the tree itself. I don't think that that means totally unrelated separate spirit who happens to live inside this particular tree. Tom talks as if the two of them are identified with each other. Um, that is, you know, the voice that he's talking to and the tree itself. But the willow man is talks as if there is some kind of separation, right? As if the two of them are not exactly the same. Um, so I think what we're getting here is some kind, just as, remember, Goldberry is a, you know, a spirit associated with the river. Um, I have become convinced uh, uh, by Irendis during the, this one of my favorite moments of exploring the Lord of the Rings so far, uh, when Irendis suggested that Goldberry is a spirit not of the water, but of the water lily, um, that I loved that idea, I still love that idea. Um, very convinced of that, uh, certainly in the context of the Fellowship of the Ring. Is that how she was seen originally? Not sure, right? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm less 100% convinced of it here in this poem. Um, but anyway, I, I think it's, uh, I, I think it's still, it still definitely works. But again, notice, we have this like animated spirit who lives within the river, within and around the river, right? Is Old Man Willow a similar thing? Do we have this spirit, the Willow Man? who lives within the willow tree. And so there is some kind of distinct this identity and yet some kind of distinction. Do we have this like spirit who is inhabiting this tree, right? So it is him, it is his tree, but it's, but he's somewhat, that seems to me very possible. It's not exactly. So for this reason, I think if we're thinking about old man willow as some kind of ent or, or, or huorn, I don't think that's correct. Um, and I feel pretty confident about that, not only because there's really, because we do get that separation, and it's not like you're going to separate Treebeard from his body, right? Um, there's no sense in which Treebeard is a separate spirit who happens to be inhabiting the body of a tree, right? That's just not how it works. What's more, it's been pretty clear as we've been doing The Return of the Shadow and the Trees of Isengard, me glancing over at the book sitting there, uh, The Return of the Shadow and the Trees of Isengard, that the whole Ent concept, the whole... Uh, concept of Treebeard and the Ents as we know them in The Lord of the Rings doesn't emerge until later on. Treebeard by name is a character long before um, long before we actually have any uh, uh, any any indicators. L long before we have any indication that he's thinking of Ents in that way. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, okay. Um, so let's... Uh, but what we have, what we have here, is a is a this sort of warring spells of sleep, right? He puts the Willow Man back to sleep again, but only after the Willow Man has put him to sleep first, right? Um, and yes, uh, book specs, I agree. Uh, Tom does seem pretty strong here, since he wakes himself up and then sends Old Man Willow off to sleep. Uh, that uh, that seems right to me. But at the same time, it's kind of hard to maintain. Remember Goldberry in the book says no, no one has ever caught Tom, you know, dancing on the hilltops and all these. He's been caught twice already in this poem, right? So uh, I'm not sure. Like, is Tom Bombadil master in the same way? Yeah, well, watch this next one. Then Tom hurried on. Rain began to shiver. Round rings spattering in the running river. A wind blew, shaken leaves, chilly drops were dripping. Into a sheltering hole, old Tom went skipping. 
Out came Badgerbrock with his snowy forehead and his dark blinking eyes. In the hill he quarried with his wife and many sons. By the coat they caught him, pulled him inside their earth, down their tunnels brought him. Inside their secret house, there they sat a mumbling. Ho, oh, Tom Bombadil, where have you... Where have you come tumbling, bursting in the front door? Badger folk have caught you. You'll never find it out the way that we have brought you. Now, old Badger Brock, do you hear me talking? You show me out at once. I must be a-walking. Show me to your back door under briar roses. Then clean grimy paws, wipe your earthy noses. Go back to sleep again on your straw pillow, like fair Goldberry and old man Willow. Then all the badger folk said, We beg your pardon. They showed Tom out again in their thor to their thorny garden, went back and hid themselves, a shivering and a shaking, blocked up all their doors, earth together raking. The badger people, right, who get the briefest of cameos, um, uh, the briefest of cameos in The Fellowship of the Ring, right, um, when... Tom starts telling the hobbits about badgers and their queer ways. Now, Marianne, I agree with you. Uh, here is where Tom shows his mastery more than anywhere else, right? The badgers are scared. Um, they're a shivering and a, qu and, and a shaking uh, when he tells them to let them go. Um, so I, I agree that uh, he does seem to have some sort of authority over them. That seems, that seems right here. Um, what do you make of the badger's actions at the beginning, right? I mean, we've, so this is the third time now he's been captured. He's yanked into the river by Goldberry. He is put to sleep and then caught in a willow crack by old, by old man Willow. And now he's been kidnapped by the badgers, or rather dragged down. So he took refuge in their holes because it was raining, right? And then when he was inside the holes, he gets grabbed and dragged down, right? Hang on a second. Gosh, isn't that a familiar kind of situation? Whose career is he following here? Do you notice? See the parallel? Tom being captured by the Badgers is like... Yeah, Estill. Like Bilbo's situation. When? When? He's like Bilbo under what circumstances? Yes, exactly, Estelle. The Goblin Cave. Absolutely. Um, the, just as so he is taking shelter in what seemed a convenient cave and unused, right? And then he gets snatched from the back of the cave and hauled down into the center of the subterranean realm, right? And, uh, and told that he's not going to be able to escape now, right? Exactly, good. Yeah, several of you are, are, are pointing to that scene. And that's really kind of interesting, right? So the Badgers don't make it into the Fellowship. Everything else gets into the, the Fellowship of the Ring. The Badgers don't make it into the Fellowship of the Ring. And it seems pretty clear why not, I think. Um, of all of the things that Tom Bombadil encounters, the Badgers are the ones that would totally not fit, right? Um for instance, like, of what size are the badgers? Exactly. They seem to be about Tom Bombadil's size. I mean, if he were able to take refuge in their tunnels, he, he must be fairly small, or they must be pretty big, right? So, uh, <laughs> B-O-U-S is, <laughs> exactly, yes. They are, they are badgers of unusual size. But, of course, I have another suggestion to make. Maybe Tom is diminutive, right? There are a couple possibilities here. One, um, and uh, uh, yeah, Mike, I agree with you. Uh, it, one way to understand this, right? One way to understand this is this does sound very Wind in the Willows kind of thing, right? Um, these seem to be anthropomorphized badgers, Though, to some extent, not to the same extent as we get in The Wind in the Willows. I mean, it's not like they have, you know, furniture and pots of beer and door scrapers and things like that, like we get uh, in The Wind in the Willows. Um, so they're not quite so thoroughly anthropomorphized, certainly, as we get there. But the way they interact is a little bit more... Um, is a little bit more... 
anthropomorphized, right, than just pure badgers. But at the same time, um, it's also possible that Tom is quite small, right? Why couldn't he be? He might be. Um, now, if you're thinking, well, wait, Tom can't be diminutive because Tolkien doesn't do diminutive fairy-type folk, right? Actually, he kind of did back in the day. Uh, there's a bunch of his early poetry which shows him doing diminutive fairy poetries. I, that happens, right? Uh, he kind of he distances himself from that in later years, but he totally did that, right? Um, so, uh, exactly, Jesse. Errantry does spring to mind. Goblin feet. Estelle is a flagrant example of that kind of thing. Um, Errantry is, in my opinion, the most explicit. Uh, version of that. Um, uh, exactly. Tarlonio is wondering if Tom has a brother who went off to sea and married a butterfly. That's exactly the kind of question, right, that I would have too. Um, and Errantry is of this same period, Tom, you're absolutely right. So, but now notice, until we, we haven't even asked that question before this point, which is interesting, right? Um, is Tom just a normal guy? He could have been a normal guy, apart from the fact he has some kind of authority. Um, this is really one of the first... Indi- I mean, the, the, unless we're, you know, him put sending them uh, off to sleep earlier on, right, uh, is, um, is clearly a, a, a sort of a big deal. But it's not been made explicit that he's a fairy-type creature or who has uh, any kind of fairy power. Um, but now it seems... Uh, at the very least plausible, right? Um, that that is uh, that that's something that has that is happening. Um, and yes, Mungly, Tom could be could possibly be the size of a child's doll. It is conceivable that he could be the size of a child's doll, because of course that's the model, right? Uh, his child did have a doll uh, named. Tom Bombadil. That's what he named him after. Uh, so the, that's an, yet another reason to think. Uh, it's not my favorite piece of evidence because I don't... Uh, anytime you sort of take a, a fact that you know from biography, you are taking a risk in applying it because you might be wrong, and I always like to put those in brackets. Uh, even when they seem obvious, actually, in some ways, the more obvious it seems, the more leery I am of going there, because the easier I think it is to be overconfident uh, in your interpretation of its relevance, um, and you're thinking about its significance. But anyway, it's hard to deny this one, right? Um, and it certainly does give some sort of indirect evidence to support the idea that he could be thinking of Tom as uh, diminutive. Uh, 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 Cass Sachs, I agree that Tom could change size to suit his situation. Um, so is it possible that Tom shrank himself down in order to get into the Badger Tunnel to get out of the rain? Possible, right? We're not told that he does that, but it is uh, it is possible. Um, and yes, Phil, I agree, being smaller would make it uh, easier uh, to be to fit into the crack uh, in the willow bark, absolutely. Um, Phil, you're right that a swan's feather would then be huge, though it seems to be a fairly prominent figure, uh, a feature rather, uh, in his outfit. Right? I mean, it's the thing that Goldberry keeps mentioning. Um, so yeah, but th- that's certainly something to think of. And Phil, perhaps that's a right evidence to suggest changing of size. I don't really know. The uncertainty of this of these facts, right? What is Tom Bombadil? Who is Tom Bombadil? Notice we're asking that from the very beginning, right? Who and what Tom Bombadil is is unclear from literally day one of the poem, which is kind of interesting, right? Now, Ethelod, great point. The badgers don't go to sleep. Uh, well, he tells them, go back, as, go back to sleep again on your straw pillow, right? Like fair gold berry and old man willow. Um, do they do it? They might after they finish shivering, shaking, blocking their doors and raking the earth together, presumably to heap up against the doors. Um, the extremity of their reaction is a little puzzling to me, right? Um, why it is that they seem so scared when Goldberry and Old Man Willow actually seem to be on kind of good terms with Tom Bombadil. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm not really sure about that. Are they? Yeah, not sure what to do with it. Um but let's uh, let's go on to encounter four. 
Rain had passed, the sky was clear, and in the summer gloaming, old Tom Bombadil laughed as he came homing, unlocked his door again and opened up a shutter. In the kitchen, round the lamp, moths began to flutter. Tom through the window saw waking stars come winking, and the new slender moon early westward sinking. Dark came under hill, Tom he lit a candle, upstairs creaking went, turned the door handle. Oh, Tom Bombadil, look what night has brought you. I'm behind the door, now at last I've caught you. You'd forgotten Barrow White dwelling in the old mound, up there on hilltop with the ring of stones round. He's got loose again, under earth he'll take you. Poor Tom Bombadil, pale and cold he'll make you. Go out, shut the door, and never come back after. Take away, gleaming eyes, take your hollow laughter. Go back to grassy mound on your stony pillow. Lay down your bony head like old man Willow, like young Goldberry and badger folk in burrow. Go back to buried gold and forgotten sorrow. Out fled Barrow White through the window leaping, through the yard over wall like a shadow sweeping. Uphill wailing went, back to leaning stone rings, back under lonely mound rattling his bone rings. Yeah, Stephanie, there's that ring of stones again, right? We can see it there originally, yeah. Um, so, Ethelod, we don't get the description of him going to sleep, but notice Tom Bombadil assumes that the Badgers did indeed go to sleep after they finished blocking up their holes, and Barrow White is heading back to his stony pillow, uh, and I don't see any reason to think he's not going to lay his head down, his bony head down upon it uh, when he gets there. Um, Rosie's wondering if that ring of stones is a red circle. Kind of, I can't help but think of that either, right? Um... <laughs> JJ thinks he might have been the white might have been more successful if he spent less time gloating about catching Tom and more time actively catching Tom. It's a classic blunder, uh, JJ. Um, what? Uh, first of all, notice. Um, notice that he is Tom. So first, the barrel white comes into the house, right? Um, and I agree that the thoughts of rings rattling on skeletal hands is super creepy. Um, rattling his bone rings is uh, is kind of is kind of very creepy. I agree with you. And of course, we get that imagery kept uh, in Tom's language about the Barrow Whites uh, in uh, the Fellowship of the Ring. Um, and Tug McGill says that Tom Bombadil is kind of a one-trick pony, right? Uh, sending people to sleep. That's what he does, right? Tom's counter spell, his, his countermeasure in every, uh, uh, in every situation seems to be go to sleep, right? Um, the Willow, the, not the Willow Man, the Barrow White, on the one hand, is more actively threatening. Um, Goldberry seems to be friendly at least if not actually flirt flirtatious old man willow and the badgers seem to be at least initially i don't think they mean him any necessary any ill will um or at least no serious ill will um i don't think they're trying to destroy him um the barrow white has a a, a more serious intention here right Poor Tom Bombadil. Under earth he'll take you. Poor Tom Bombadil. Pale and cold he'll make you. That's pretty serious, right? Um, he is going to do, he wants to do to Tom Bombadil what the Barrow Whites, very similar to what the Barrow Whites are going to want to do to Frodo, right? right? And the rest of the hobbits in the Fellowship of the Ring. He wants to make him like them. He wants to take them, take him into his barrow uh, and to make him pale and cold like the dead. Does that mean he's going to kill him? I don't know that it's quite that simple, right? I'll kill you and then I'll lay you out in the barrow. Um, or rather, is it just going to, is, is he going to make him like unto one of the whites? Um, you know, that's that's clear. Now, Blue Wizard, I wouldn't even be asking that question. Um, try to resist asking that question about like, is Tom a human being or is he a Maya or what? That's totally irrelevant here. This has nothing to do with Middle Earth. Try to remember that. This has nothing to do with Middle-earth. It will eventually, right? But this has nothing to do with Middle-earth. This is not part of Tolkien's legendarium at all. There is zero reason to suspect uh, that Tom Bombadil or any of these creatures have anything to do with any of the Middle-earth stuff that Tolkien has writing or has written or is writing. Um, 
So try not to even formulate the questions here in the terms that are sort of native to the legendarium. All of these things are traditional, traditional English folklore, right, about the 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 water spirits that drag you into rivers, the female water spirits that drag you into rivers, um, willow trees capturing you. Um, the willow trees are known to sneak up behind people and capture them and kill them, right? That that's that's a thing that happens in uh, again, it's a it's it's a folklore thing. Um, Badgers. I don't. I don't know what's up with badgers. I, I, why badgers have this particular reputation? Though there might be, you know, some kind of traditional folklore explanation for that as well. I can easily imagine. Uh, and then there's uh, the Barrow Whites, right? Um, the idea that uh, the dead in barrows can walk about, not unknown, right? Uh, so yeah, that seems. Uh, this seems all. Um, uh, sort of normal. Um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> he comes into the house. The Barrow White invades the house, right? Again, I suggest Tom Bombadil does not have the kind of mastery. He is able to command people to go to sleep and they seem to do it, right? His sleep spell seems to work pretty well. I saw you guys joking about that. He does seem to have a fairly high caster level, at least on his sleep specialization, but he doesn't... Um, uh, he doesn't seem to have, the, I mean, you know, remember nothing passes, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 a door or window except moonlight and starlight and wind off the hilltop. That's not true, right? Here. The Barrow White comes right into the house. Tom Bombadil sends him packing, but he comes, he comes right into the house. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that, um, He's in a different position, and again, we can't kind of associate him. JJ's wondering: Is you know, is Tom a sort of Sandman? I mean, is, does he have a folklore role as well? Like, is is he <clears throat> supposed to be like the dude who makes people go to sleep? <laughs> right? Um, he is such a one-trick pony that I couldn't rule that out. Uh, that seems to me one interesting explanation of. Uh, um, yeah. Now, Mike, that's a great question. Is the Barrow White the dead person or the remains animated by something else? No idea. We're not told at all. Right. Again, we know about how that explanation works within a Lord of the Rings context. But here we have nothing, nothing at all. All we know is that this is a Barrow White. And remember, when Tolkien wrote this Barrow White, a white wasn't a thing. Um, whites are a particular species of undead. Right. Um and uh, but that's thanks to Dungeons and Dragons, who was lifting it directly from Tolkien. A, a huge portion of the first edition monster manual is cribbed straight out of the Lord of the Rings. Um, whites are one of those things. Why are why are whites a subspecies of undead? Because uh, uh, because Dungeons and Dragons took that from Tolkien. Um, exactly, Mike. White just means person. It's a very generic traditional word. Um, it means like guy or dude. I mean, that's that's the uh, you know like I saw three whites just means like I saw three folks, people, dudes, right? Um, so a barrel white is you know as we joked about years ago uh, is literally grave dude is 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 a literal translation of Barrow White. This is a grave dude, right? What does that even mean? We don't even know what that means. He seems to be undead. He's an animated corpse, right? But how did he get animated? By what power is he animated? Uh, we don't know, right? But there's a lot of things we don't know. We don't know who the Willow Man is. We don't know what's up with Goldberry. We don't know why the Badgers are acting in this unusual way. Um, we don't know any of these things. So that's uh, that's fine. That's fine. Um, yeah, so barrow, a barrow doesn't mean grave, but a barrow is a grave, right? It's a little more than a grave. Um, of course, you know, the barrow is the, the mound in which usually someone important was interred, often with their wealth and treasures. So you have, that's why you have the treasures and things associated with it. Um, so a barrow, but, and, and a barrow could be, I guess, a more, a more literal synonym, a closer synonym to barrow would be tomb, I guess I would say. Um, but because um, you do have, you know, barrows that would be opened to bury somebody else from the family in, for instance. You know, that's a thing that could that could totally happen. Um, is the white even corporeal he'll f here? Phil is a good question. I don't know if he's corporeal. It sounds like he is. Uh, 
the fact that he has to jump out the window suggests that he's corporeal, or he doesn't just pass through the walls or something like that. So I don't think he's a ghost. Um, uh, is he skeletal or zombie-like? Skeletal, I think he's got he's got uh, bony fingers, but of course, who knows exactly what that means? It could just mean thin and emaciated fingers, right? So he could be a, a dried out, desiccated zombie for all we know. Um, notice he doesn't see him. We don't get a physical description. Um, we get a an auditory distinction, right? Tom knows what he looks like, like take away gleaming eyes. We don't see the gleaming eyes. We're just told about them, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, very good. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Sam, you're right. Dungeons and Dragons didn't only crib from Tolkien. He was one of their major sources, but they didn't only crib from, from him. Um, yeah. Uh, Brendan, I don't remember... I don't think Tolkien ever drew a picture of Barrow Whites. It's a great question, because, of course, Tolkien did do many illustrations. I don't think he ever did an illustration of the Barrow Whites. Not that I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Don't think so. Um, cool. All right, let's keep going. Old Tom Bombadil lay upon his pillow, sweeter than Goldberry, quieter than the willow, snugger than the badger folk or the barrow dwellers, slept like a humming top, snored like a bellows. So here Tom goes to sleep himself. After his long and busy day of sending other people to sleep, he sleeps, and he sleeps more soundly than all of them. Uh, I lo- sweeter than Goldberry is my favorite line. You know, he, he exceeds all of them. He's more quiet than the Willow Man, more snug than the Badger Folk. Though being more snug than a Barrow White is perhaps a low bar to, to, uh, to, to exceed. Um, as King Loon would say, that's no great mastery. Uh, but anyway, yeah, all that is interesting. Okay. He woke in morning light, whistled like a starling, sang, Come, Derry Doll, Merry Doll, my darling. He clapped on his battered hat, boots, coat, and feather, opened the window wide to the sunny weather. Wise old Bombadil, he was a wary fellow. Bright blue his jacket was, and his boots were yellow. None ever caught old Tom in upland or in dingle, walking the forest paths or by the withy window, or out on the lily pools in boat upon the water. But one day, Tom, he went and caught the river daughter. In green gown, flowing hair, sitting in the rushes, singing old water songs to birds upon the bushes. Okay, so this is uh, uh, Tom uh, uh, Tom Bombadil did a wooing go at this point now. Um, we get this assertion, not of Tom's mastery, but that, that, that concept that none ever caught Tom in Upland or in Dingle, walking the forest paths or by the withy window. Um, that sort of claim of some kind of inviolability for Tom under the circumstances when he's just been caught by four people is kind of interesting. Um, (laughs) uh, Lynn, that is a really interesting point. Lynn is pointing out if he's quieter than the willow and he's snoring like a bellows, what does that suggest about the willow man? Right. Is he enormously uh, uh, noisy in his sleeping? Um, You know, uh, I don't really know what to make of that, Lynn. I, I, I can't help but think, sweeter than Goldberry, quieter than the willow. Um, now, that's an interesting way. Hang on. Somebody had a cool suggestion there. Who was that? Um, yeah, JJ said, does sweeter than Goldberry refer to Tom or his pillow? Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Right. Uh, um, lay, up, lay upon his pillow, sweeter than Goldberry, quieter than the willow. I, I I don't think, uh, I mean, of course the pillow's quiet, right? What's the pillow going to do, right? So I, it's hard for me to see that second line as modifying pillow, though it is the nearest noun. Um, it seems like it would have to describe Tom Bombadil, in which case, Lynn, as you point out, I almost have to think that the snoring like a bellows is like the punchline of the joke that that stanza is giving us, right? Except it doesn't work in all ways. Um, it's not like he's saying things which then he kind of twists around at the end, right? Um, yeah. Uh, now, uh, um, 
uh, winged elf girl okay I see your Twitter handle now yeah now it is true that he he's it, when he is caught he's only caught temporarily right so um, you know I, I suppose it depends on how we define caught exactly right um, he's not um, he gets away all the all the time um, but yeah yeah I think that that's uh, that seems a plausible interpretation of that, though it still seems a strange, slightly strange thing for me to say. Um, Rosie, I agree as far as the, his having quiet sleep. That would be a way to understand it, right? That he slept quietly, no nightmares, peacefully, right? Um, I don't know. Yeah, okay, Tongo is thinking quiet is being used in terms of motion and not sound. Maybe. Maybe to be sleeping quietly instead of tossing and turning, for instance. So kind of like what Rosie was suggesting, but thinking about that more physically. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Tim, that's a, that's a, Tim says he's, he's tripped up, but not permanently caught, right? Um, yes, yes. Um, yeah, Lynn, I also don't quite know how his sleeping is like a humming top. I think it's got to be the noise. I don't think it's like him rolling around in the bed like a top. That's not peaceful, <laughs> right? That's not particularly snug, uh, nor particularly sweet. Um, I think it means like the steady hum of uh, a top as it's spinning. Um, yes, yeah, so I think that those are two auditory descriptions, a bellows and a humming top, to describe the noise he makes while he's sleeping. That's how I, 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 I would have to understand this. Um, anyway, okay. He's going and catching the river daughter, right? Now, catching in what sense? Well, let's keep reading. We'll read the catching. He caught her, held her fast. Water rats went scurrying. Reeds hissed, herons cried, and her heart was fluttering. Said Tom Bombadil, here's my pretty maiden. You shall come home with me. The table is all laden. Yellow cream, honeycomb, white bread and butter. Roses at the window sill and peeping round the shutter. You shall come under hill. Never mind your mother in her deep weedy pool. There you'll find no lover. Old Tom Bombadil had a merry wedding, crowned all with buttercups, hat and feather shedding. His pride with forget-me-nots and flag lilies, sorry, his bride with forget-me-nots and flag lilies for garland was robed all in silver green. He sang like a starling, hummed like a honeybee, lilted to the fiddle, clasping his river maid round her slender middle. Um, yes, so uh, the, I just wanted to make it officially known I am not advocating this as a courtship mechanism. Uh, I, this is, uh, yeah, um, uh, I, I urge you not to reenact this scene uh, with any river daughters uh, that you happen to meet, um, even if they drag you in. Um, yeah, so Winged Elf Girl, this is a sort of sweet kidnapping sort of situation that's described, which I know is like makes modern people really uncomfortable. Um, but uh, what's the context for that? What's the con? Uh, that is, uh, in what context do we should we be understanding this? Do you think? In what sense? In what sense is Tom Bombadil's catching Goldberry okay, right? Again, not in a contemporary dating context, right? But in what sense is? Remember who we're talking about, right? Um, yes, Tungo, it's very fairy tale like. Um, what when? When does this kind of thing happen in fairy tales? Do you see the kind of thing that is going on here, right? Um, can anybody think of other examples of this kind of thing? Now, you're right, Blue Wizard, she did try to catch him first, and he's just reciprocating. The kind of rough and tumble that they've had before suggests that, you know, this is kind of okay. Um, uh, I agree, we did get a lot of teasing earlier on um, and so yes there is um, 
uh, you know, the, the, this sort of teasing context would seem to be appropriate as well. Um, Wolfreg, yes, we do get, we do see somebody else who does this. The Errantry dude captures his butterfly bride in the same way. This is also a folktale tradition. How do you catch a fairy, right? Um, the idea that you grab on and don't let go until they make a promise, right? That's a thing. That's a thing in folklore and fairy tale tradition, right? Um, that even... It's the way you have to do it. Um, that in some sense, perhaps because of the kind of creature, she can't. you can't just go and get her consent, go and say, hi, you want to, uh, would you marry me? Well, I've got a cute little cottage up here, right? I, I, I have some um, um, yellow cream and honeycomb and white bread and butter for the wedding feast and some flowers for you. Want to come live with me? And she's like, okay, right? Um, that's not necessarily how it works, right? That there's like rules to these things. Um, so yeah, Tim Dolph is thinking of Baron and Luthien, right? Uh, Baron had the same idea, right? Um, uh, so I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about human cultures in which bride stealing is normal. That is a thing. And certainly goodness knows there are plenty of traditions for that. I'm not talking, I'm explicitly talking about fairy tale tradition and folklore traditions in which in order for a person to interact with a fairy uh, you have to you have to do this um, so um, yeah I, I that's that's um, I think something that you uh, 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 can see going on in uh, in this that, that you know we do have precedence uh, for that Um Yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, d d does that make sense? And again, you know, we'd have to we'd have to dig a lot more into you know the tradition of like selkies and fairies. Even things somebody mentioned. Yeah, Tom Hillman, of course, mentioned Proteus. We see the same kind of idea there, right? Um, that uh, in order to get Proteus to do, like you want Proteus to do you a favor, you've got to like how, how you do it is you pounce on him and you hold him down and to, you know, and you know keep holding him no matter what form he changes into, and then he's got to answer your questions. That kind of thing, like that, that that's how you interact with creatures of this kind, right? Uh, that seems to me the kind of story that we're in here, just as the the river person folktale is the kind of story that we're in at the beginning when she pulls him in. Um, that seems to be the way that we are here. Um, so, yeah, so again, I, I, everything we've seen from the beginning of this poem suggests we're not thinking about human courtship rituals at all, that Goldberry is definitely not human. Tom is probably not human, almost certainly not human. Um, this is a, this is a, this is a fairy thing. Right. And it's within a fairy context that we're hearing this. So, again, I know it's this whole idea of him uh, of him kidnapping Goldberry and bringing him, bringing her home and making her marry him seems uncomfortable in lots of totally understandable ways. Um, but um, but yeah, this is um, uh, this is definitely uh, definitely a different kind of context here. Um, so. Uh, good, good. Um, let me, uh, let's keep going. We're almost at the end here. Lamps gleamed within his house, and white was the bedding. In the bright honeymoon, badger folk came treading, danced down under hill, and old man Willow tapped, tapped at window pane as they slept on the pillow. On the bank, in the reeds, river woman sighing, heard Barrow White in his mound crying. Old Tom Bombadil heeded not the voices, taps knocked, knocks dancing feet, all the nightly noises, slept till the sun arose, then sang like a starling, Hey, come, Derry doll, Merry doll, my darling, sitting on the doorstep, chopping sticks of willow, while fair Goldberry combed her tresses yellow. Um, I love these little things which, like, make some of the details in the Fellowship of the Ring just pop out in really new ways. Like the fact that Old Man Willow actually does come and tap at the windowpane, right? Uh, the, you know, when when uh, when Mary, here, or when, no, it's 
Pippin. Yeah, it's Pippin. Uh, when Pippin hears the the creak of the will of this, you know, on the windows, and he's like, "Are there willow trees near the house?" And he thinks a willow tree has come up to the house and is creaking at the window and trying to reach in and get him, or maybe he's inside a willow tree. Right in the poem, Old Man Willow literally does come up and tap on the window. Right. So, by the way, you see what's going on here. Um. This is a sort of raucous wedding night celebration, also a traditional thing, right? Um, that when the... This is something that modern people have a really hard time with. Uh, in older English culture, the consummation of the wedding on the wedding night was, if not quite a public ritual, a moment of public fun when the bride and groom were put into bed together and usually there would have been um, uh, commentary from outside under the window or like people shouting through the door that not at all uncommon for there to be that kind of uproarious um, uh, earthy sort of humor going on during those kinds of moments that's like that it was a part of the wedding celebration and that's what's going on here right the uh the badger folk, old man Willow, are giving them a hard time <laughs> on their wedding night. Um, and J.J., no, the Barrow White seems not to be invited. Um, uh, this is, um, he's crying in his mound, right? Uh, which is interesting, right? Is he, he's, he's weeping as the happiness and celebration is going on, right, in the house. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah. Winged Elf Girl reminds me that uh, as recently as mid 20th century, we see the same kind of thing coming uh, happening in the musical Oklahoma. Right. It's not it's not so far in the distance uh, that you can still uh, hear evidence of this same of that same kind of thing. Um, uh, yeah. And we get the, the, the badger folk uh, dancing under the hill. Um and the river woman sighing, right? We got some mother-in-law issues uh, looming here, clearly. Um, but Tom Bombadil doesn't heed the nightly noises, right? Um, yeah. He slept till the sun arose and sang like a starling. Um, hey, come, dairy doll, merry doll, merry doll, my darling, would seem to be addressed to uh, Goldberry there, right? Um, last stands, uh, last, okay, actually, no, that's it. Yeah, that, that's the end of, uh, while fair Goldberry combed her tresses yellow. And I thought there was one more stanza, but there's not. So that's the end of the, that's, that's where the first adventures of Tom Bombadil ends with his waking up in the first day of his, uh, married life with Goldberry, right? Um, and he's chopping willow sticks pointedly, I can't help but think, on his doorstep, right? After old man Willow gives him a hard time, during his wedding night, the night before that that morning, the last thing we see of Tom Bombadil is with his hatchet and some willow sticks. I think this is all in good fun still, right? Um, I think this is uh, him getting a little of his own back and uh, 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 teasing old man Willow back. Uh, probably not. Uh, he's probably not had it down uh, uh, if he had to gnaw it. Um, but but yeah, Mike, I agree. The ending the story with a with a marriage is certainly very traditional uh, in many in many places. Um, okay, very good. So I want to go. We're gonna. I'm gonna go more quickly through Bombadil goes boating. Um, it's uh, uh, it's a little bit more of a continuous narrative in some ways. Let's go on to Bombadil goes boating. The old year was turning brown. The west wind was calling. Tom caught a beechen leaf in the forest falling. Well, hang on a second. I'm just jumping into reading the poem. Let's remember the context. This poem was written in the 1960s. This is a sequel. It was written well after The Lord of the Rings was written. So now we can be thinking in the context of The Lord of the Rings. Uh, this is The Lord of the Rings. Well, this is, the to this, is a this is a Tom Bombadil based on The Lord of the Rings, Tom Bombadil, right? So with The Lord of the Rings in mind, uh, Tolkien writing this more than 10 years after he wrote the Tom Bombadil portions of the Fellowship of the Ring. Um, so that's the context of this, of this poem. 
The old year was turning brown, the west wind was calling. Tom caught a beechen leaf in the forest falling. I've caught a happy day, blown me by the breezes. Why wait till morrow year? I'll take it when me pleases. This day I'll mend my boat and journey as it chances, west down the withy stream, following my fancies. Little bird sat on twig. Hello, Tom, I heed you. I've a guess, I've a guess, where your fancies lead you. Shall I go, shall I go, bring him word to meet you? No names, no names, you tell-tale, or I'll skin and eat you, babbling in every ear things that don't concern you. If you tell Willow Man where I've gone, I'll burn you, roast you on a willow spit. That'll end your prying. Willow Wren cocked her tail, piped as she went flying. Catch me first, catch me first, no names are needed. I'll perch on his hither ear, the message will be heeded. Down by mythe, I'll say, just as the sun is sinking. Hurry up, hurry up. That's time for drinking. Okay, so um, we got our first interaction here between Tom and the Willow Wren, right? Um, and again, you can tell that Tom and the Willow Wren are really good friends, right? How can you tell that Tom and the Willow Wren are very good friends? Because of uh, how he threatens to uh, skin, roast, and eat the Willow Wren, right? This is all in good fun. Uh, it's rather extreme uh, talk of this kind, but uh, yeah, yeah. Um, this is, um, uh, yeah, and there goes the little bird telling gossip. Exactly, Winged Elf Girl. That's, uh, that's just right. Um, by the way, yeah, is the Mythe River moithering, right? Or, or, uh, uh, Tim Dolph wants to know. That's a great question, right? Um, I, uh, Tom tells the bird not to tell anybody about where he's going, right? What is the bird, what is the bird doing? What's the bird up to? You following this? We've seen birds acting like this before, right? I'll perch on his hither ear, the message will be heeded. As soon as the wren tells, or sees Tom, right, the wren says, oh, I'll go tell him you're coming, right? Um, and he doesn't even need to be told the message. Down by my, I'll say, just as the sun is sinking. Now, yeah, this is a lot like the thrush, exactly. Exactly. Um, and what's more, um, what's more, he doesn't need to be told, the wren doesn't need to be told the message, right? The wren seems to know where Tom is going, to whom to deliver a message, and what the message is going to be. Indeed, it's the wren himself who dictates what the message is going to be. Right, like he's telling Tom what to do, rather than taking Tom's message. Um, go down, down to down by Mythe as the sun is sinking. That's the time for drinking. Okay, is the wren going to blab where he's going to Old Man Willow? No, and I think Tom knows that he's not going to do that. Right, Tom is teasing him or she. Excuse me. Yes. Um, Tom's yes, it is it is it is a, it is a girl wren. Sorry, uh, Tom's teasing her, right? Um, threatening to roast her on a willow spit, right? To end her prying. Yeah. Look who's next. Tom laughed to himself. Maybe then I'll go there. I might go by other ways, but today I'll row there. He shaved oars, patched his boat. From Hidden Creek he hauled her, through reed and sallow break, under leaning alder. Then down the river went singing silly sallow, flow withy willow stream over deep and shallow. Whee, Tom Bombadil, whither be you going, bobbing in a cockle boat down the river rowing? Maybe to Brandywine along the withy window. Maybe friends of mine fire for me will kindle. Down by the hay's end, little folk I know there, kind at the day's end. Now and then I go there. 
Take word to my kin, bring me back their tidings. Tell me of diving pools and fishes' hidings. Nay, then, said Bombadil, I am only rowing, just to smell the water like, not on errands going. Now, it's not yet clear who he's talking to, right? There's someone who is saying, Hui Tom Bombadil, whither be you going? We don't know who it is yet. We're being given no hint. Okay, we're given a hint before the end of this section, right? Where ex- who, who exactly he's talking to. Um, somebody says, where are you going? And Tom says, maybe he's going to the Brandywine. Uh, friends of his are going to kindle fire for him there down by the Hayes End. He knows little folk there. Tom's going to the Shire to see his friends. That's what the Willow Wren was suggesting, to meet them by Mythe, right? Um, and that's the time for drinking. He's going to meet them at, at, at sundown, right, uh, to have a beer. Uh, this is what the Wren assumes. And Tom acts like he's going to go along with it. Maybe then I'll go there, right? And he decides to row. His interlocutor, who is unclear at this point, says, Take word to my kin, bring me back their tidings. Tell me of diving pools and fishes' hidings. That's the only hint we've been given yet as to who or what Tom is talking to. Right? This uh, creature has asked him to say hi to his uh, kin for him and to uh, report back about any diving pools or places where fish are hiding that he's going to see. So who is it? Tee-hee, cocky Tom. Mind your tub, don't founder. Look out for willow shags. I'd laugh to see you flounder. Talk less, fisher blue. Keep your kindly wishes. Fly off and preen yourself with the bones of fishes. Gay lord on your bow, at home a dirty varlet, living in a sloven house, though your basket be scarlet. I've heard of fisher birds beak in the air a dangling to show how the wind is set. That's an end of angling. It's a kingfisher, right? Uh, not a black kingfisher fisher from Mirkwood, presumably, right? But a normal blue kingfisher. Um, uh, so it's another bird that he's talking to. And also Tom Bombadil threatens to kill this one too and to hang its beak in the air as a weather vane. Right. Um, Which would be an end of his angling. Right. An end of his fishing. Um, uh, This seems to be the kind of repartee that Tom adopts with the local birds. Now, notice overall trend here. Right. Um, What we see Tolkien doing in this new Tom Bombadil poem is we get, first of all, his intention to go visit the hobbits. So we're going to get Tom Bombadil's interaction with the Shire, which is really interesting. Right. Mentioned uh, in The Lord of the Rings, but we never actually see it. Now, in addition to that, or on the way to that, we see him interacting with the other living creatures of the forest, right? And we know that he he knows and understands their tales and their ways. We see the the tales that he tells to uh, uh, to Frodo and the other hobbits, and we were just talking in the past two weeks about the impact of this, right? How Tom Bombadil shows them how like to see the world through the eyes of these other creatures, right? We know that Tom understands them. Now we see that Tom Tom has a very sort of casual, jocking, jocular relationship. Ethelod, this is teasing. He's teasing them. He's not actually threatening to kill them. Um, uh, they are... This is a very... Uh, uh, this is a very British kind of friendship. But notice, this is how the hobbits talk to each other all the time. Think about how much... Uh, how much of a hard time, like, Merry, Pippin, and Frodo especially give each other. Like, go back to chapter one, right, uh, and, uh, and, and, and read some, uh, some, some, some more of that. Um, yeah, he's, he's, uh, this is, it's all in good fun. Again, you can tell, remember that line when, uh, one of my favorite lines when King Theoden, uh, says upon Gimli's, uh, encounter with the hobbits in Isengard, right, uh, uh, and, uh, he, like, starts, sort of raging and insulting them, and then they insult him back, and uh, Theoden says, there can be no doubt that we see the reunion of, uh, of, of, of good friends, right? You, you can tell that they're really good friends by how they're insulting each other, right? That's a, that's a normal thing. Um, and yet, Stephanie, that's actually a really good point. Uh, look at Lobelia Sackville Baggins and her insults. You can hear the difference. You can hear the difference between Lobelia's insults 
uh, and the insult, for instance, with which Mary responds, you know, uh, when Frodo turns to Mary Brandybuck after Lobelia has insulted him, Mary then insults him right away, right? And you can see, like, this is, uh, uh, this is the way they, they interact with each other. Um, so, uh, yeah, good. Um, and, uh, yeah, Wolfreg, you're right. Uh, they do have a friend called Fatty, right? Even the names they give each other are, uh, uh, rather, uh, often insulting names. Yeah. Um, okay. The King Fisher, the King's Fisher shut its beak and winked his eye as singing. Tom passed under bow, flash, then he went winging, dropped down jewel blew a feather, and Tom caught it. Gleaming in a sun ray, a pretty gift, he thought it. He stuck it in his tall hat, the old feather casting. Blue now for Tom, he said, a merry hue lasting. The friends, right? Uh, as he's going, you know, the kingfisher dives down after a fish, and uh, he he drops a feather for Tom to put in his hat, right? And Tom immediately, you know, he casts off his old feather. Uh, it's pro- probably not the same swan wing feather that has been draggled for a long time. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, you know, he, 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 he gets rid of his old feather and replaces it with this nice new bright blue feather that the kingfisher has given him, right? They're friends, right? Clearly they're friends. A merry hue lasting. Rings swirled round his boat. He saw the bubbles quiver. Tom slapped his oar smack at a shadow in the river. Whoosh, Tom Bombadil, tis long since last I met you. Turned water boatman, eh? What if I upset you? What? Why, whisker lad, I'll, I'd ride you I'd ride you down the river. My fingers on your back would set your hide a shiver. Pish, Tom Bombadil, I'll go and tell my mother. Call all our kin to come, father, sister, brother. Tom's gone mad as a coot, with wooden legs he is paddling. Down with windle stream, an old tub is straddling. I'll give your otter fell to the barrow whites. They'll taw you, then smother you in gold rings. Your mother, if she saw you, she'd never know her son unless twas by a whisker. Nay, don't tease old Tom until you be far brisker. Whoosh, said otter lad, river water spraying. Over Tom's hat and all, set the boat a-swaying. Dive down under it, and by the bank lay peering, till Tom's merry song faded out of hearing. So the otter, of course, we get more of the same kind of hobbitry, right? More of the same kind of banter back and forth between Tom and the otter. Um, and notice the substance of their teasing here, right? Um, the otter is teasing Tom Bombadil for being in a boat. Like, oh, you've turned into a water boatman, huh? Right? Uh, you know, I could knock you out of your boat. He's, th- you know, he's threatening to wet him. And of course, he does splash him later on. He spits water at him, right? And sprays him with water. Um uh, and uh, when Tom Bombadil says that, it's, uh, you know, if he knocks him over, he'll ride him down the river, right? And then uh, he threatens to rally his whole kin to come up against him. Um, then Tom gets nasty again, right? Threatens to skin him and give his uh, uh, give his uh, his his fell, right? His his hide, his pelt uh, to the Barrow Whites. And yes, Wolfrig, this is a very subtle reference to Norse mythology, too. Uh, the association between gold rings and an otter. Yeah, it's a, it's a long story. But yes, uh, it's a Norse mythology reference there as well. And yes, uh, JJ, it is really cool that whoosh uh, is what, the, is what the, the, the otter says. But that's clearly, uh, that's clearly uh, onomatopoeia as well, right? That's, that's what he says. It's the sound he makes as he is spraying the water, I think, pretty clearly there, too. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Got to provide your own sound effects sometimes, Terrell O'Neill says. Exactly. Exactly. Old Swan of Elvet Isle sailed past him proudly. Gave Tom a black look, snorted at him loudly. Tom laughed. You old cob, do you miss your feather? Give me a new one, then. The old was worn by weather. Could you speak a fair word, I would love you dearer. Long necks and dumb throat, but a haughty sneerer. If one day the king returns, in upping he may take you. Brand your yellow bill, and less lordly make you. Old Swan huffed his wings, hissed and paddled faster. In his wake, bobbing on, Tom went rowing after. Um, yeah, yeah, good. Um, yeah, exactly, Wolfrey. Yeah, and, uh, Loki kills the otter, 
uh, and it causes all manner of troubles. Um, but uh, yep, 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 that uh, creates a that creates a big problem. So, the swan, of course, traditionally in England, swans were the king's birds. Um, the king officially owned all of the swans, and that same tradition seems to hold here. Tom is teasing the swan because, of course, the king is coming. Remember, this is post Lord of the Rings, right? Um, so the king is indeed going to return to the Northlands, and Tom is teasing the swan. Right, the swan is holding itself with great dignity, as swans do, right, or at least as they appear to do, uh, and uh, sneering and looking down at Tom. But you see. Tom's reading of this, right? Why is the swan sneering at him? Because he's wearing a blue feather in his hat, right? The swan knows he, sh- he was wearing a swan feather. He's wearing one of his feathers in his hat. So the swan is insulted, right? That he's replaced the swan feather with a, with a, with a blue kingfish, uh, kingfisher feather, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I, th- is this uh, before the ring is destroyed? No, I think it's after, actually. I think this is post-Lord post, post Lord of the Rings, post-Scouring the Shire, uh, is, I believe, what we see happening here. Because um, we know things started to go south in the Shire pretty quickly after, uh, the, after you know, the four hobbits left. Um, and I, that's, I think, not the environment that we're going to see when we get there. Um... I love that the swan doesn't say anything, right? Uh, the swan just looks kind of haughty, and uh, Tom sort of uh, puts words in the swan's mouth. Uh, but uh, but yeah, it doesn't actually doesn't actually say anything. Uh, doesn't need to, right? Tom knows just what the swan's thinking. Tom came to Withyweir, down the river rushing, foamed into Windle Reach, a bubbling and a splashing. Bore Tom over stones, spinning like a windfall, bobbing like a bottle cork to the high that grinned wall. So he's now going into the Shire, right? Uh, he comes down to the Withy Weir uh, by the Windle Reach. We don't know too much about these places, right? But he's sailing down the Withy Window, not sailing, he's paddling down the Withy Window to the Brandywine, right? Um, and truly, you know, as, um, uh, as the the otter suggests he doesn't seem to be the best boat uh, boatsman in the world um uh spinning like a windfall bobbing like a bottle cork is not a flattering description of uh uh tom's progress down the river in his little boat um yeah yeah um Hoy, here's Woodman Tom with his billy beard on, laughed all the little folk of Hayes End and Brerdon. Where, Tom, will shoot you dead with our bows and arrows? We don't let forest folk nor bogies from the barrows cross over Brandywine by cockleboat nor ferry. Fie, little fat bellies, don't ye make so merry. I've seen hobbit folk digging holes to hide em, frightened if a horny gat or a badger eyed em. Afeard of the moony beams, their own shadows shunning. I'll call the orcs on you, that'll send you running. You may call, Woodman Tom, and you can talk your beard off. Three arrows in your hat, you were, you we're not afraid of. You we're not afeard of, sorry. Where would you go now, if for beer you're making? The barrels aren't deep enough in Brereton for your slaking. Away over Brandywine, by Shireborn I'll be going, but too swift for a cockleboat, for a cockleboat the river now is flowing. I'd bless little folk that took me in their wherry, wish them evenings fair and many mornings merry. Uh, okay, we see him bantering with the hobbits too, but more than banter, do you notice what happened? What did the hobbits just do? <laughs> did you notice? What did he just do? Yes, JJ, the hobbits are associated with archery. We see there's actually a hobbit guard here, right? And they claim to be guarding against anything coming out of the forest. And they've got their bows and arrows. And JJ, yes, they they've literally shot arrows into Tom Bombadil's hat. Right, so they've shot arrows at his head, missing him on purpose. Right, three arrows in your hat. 
they say. Um, that seems to be quite literal. They've actually shot arrows into his hat. Because that's fun, right? Um, and they also invite him in to drink. Well, and they tease him about how much he drinks, right? That is to say, like, you know, there's like the, the barrels ain't deep enough in Brereton for your slaking, right? If you're looking for beer, oh, we don't have enough here for you, right? Um uh, yeah, and uh, JJ, that level of archery does sound very, very Robin Hood-ish, right? Uh, absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Wolfreg wonders how Tom acquired such a reputation. He's apparently known, right? You can tell how, like, he's a stranger coming out of the old forest, coming down the withy window on a boat out of the old forest. They don't bat an eye at this, right? They're not like, who are you, stranger? They're like, oh, it's old. Here's here's Woodman Tom, with his billy beard on, they start teasing him about his beard immediately and doing fun things like shooting arrows into his hat, right? They clearly know Tom Bombadil. And and obviously they've drunk with him before uh, because they know he can put away enough beer to, uh, or at least they're teasing him for that. Um, so I would say either he drinks a lot of beer or he doesn't actually drink very much, right? One of the two, because they're teasing him about drinking up all of the beer in the town. My suspicion is that he drinks a lot rather than none at all, but... Uh, but yeah, exactly, Stephanie. They are not asking him who he is, right? Um, that's definitely not what's going on here. Um, Red flowed the brandy wine, with flame the river kindled, as sun sank beyond the shire, and then to grey it dwindled. Mithe steps empty stood, none was there to greet him. Silent the causeway lay, said Tom, a merry meeting. He's just taken the ferry across the withy wind. He's just asking them to ferry him across the brandy wine, right? Um, and there's nobody there at the opposite bank. A merry meeting, he says. Tom stumped along the road as, as the light was failing. Rushy lamps gleamed ahead. He heard a voice him hailing. Whoa there! Ponies stopped. Wheels halted sliding. Tom went plodding past, never looked beside him. Ho oh, there, beggar man, trampling in the marish. What's your business here, hat all stuck with arrows? Someone warned you off, caught you at your sneaking? Come here, tell me, what is it you're seeking? Shire ale, I'll be bound, though you've not a penny. I'll bid them lock their doors, and then you won't get any. Who's talking? Farmer Maggot, of course, right? Uh, who sees Tom Bombadil on the road and immediately starts giving him a hard time. Right? Uh, beggar man trampling the marish. What's your business here? Somebody warned you off, obviously, right? Somebody knew you shot your hat full of arrows to warn you off, right? Caught you sneaking around, right? Uh, trespassing, most likely. Right? What are, you, what are you after? Probably beer, right? Though you've not a penny to pay for it, right? That's why he calls him beggar man, right? Um, here's Farmer Maggot taking his pony trap to the ferry again, right? Except this time he's a little late, late to meet Tom Bombadil. How does he know to meet Tom Bombadil? Why does why is Tom marveling that he's not there, you know, teasing him? A merry meeting, right, when he finds nobody there? The wren told him, right? That's what happened at the very beginning. The wren said, I'll go tell him to meet you at the Mythe, which is uh, clearly, in this context now, the uh, the other side of the withy window, right? Um... Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, oh, that's a really good point. Um, JJ, notice that he's not... Tr the, the rhyme is really loose in this poem. I don't have time to look at that in too much detail, but it's interesting. Some of them are very approximate. Um, uh, some of them are not really rhymes at all. There are several places where he just kind of a briefly abandons rhyme entirely. Um, I would like to... It is more loose in General Tungo, I totally agree. Um, I would love to look at this poem a little bit more closely in that regard and see if there's any kind of pattern or trend or tendency that we can see in those moments when the rhyme just kind of goes away. Um, I don't think Marish and Arrows are a very good rhyme under any circumstances, right? There's the very loose, very approximate. But as I say, there seem to be some places where he um, just sort of briefly leaves it behind almost entirely. That seems to be part of what we see happening in this poem. But like I say, we don't have. Uh, I don't want to. I don't, don't want to. Uh, we're running out of time here. 
Well, well, muddy feet, from one that's late for meeting, away back by the mythe, that's a surly greeting. You old farmer fat that cannot walk for a wheezing, cart drawn like a sack, ought to be more ple ought to be more pleasing. Penny wise tub on legs, a beggar can't be chooser, or else I'd bid you go, and you would be the loser. Come, maggot, help me up, a tankard now you owe me, even in cockshut light an old friend should know me. Laughing they drove away, and rushy never halting, through the, the th though the inn open stood, and they could smell the malting. They turned down Maggot's lane, rattling and bumping, Tom in the farmer's cart, dancing round and jumping. Tars st stars shone on Bam furlong, and Maggot's house was lighted, fire in the kitchen burned, to welcome the benighted. Maggot's sons bowed at door, his daughters did they curtsy. His wife brought tankards out for those that might be thirsty. Songs they had in merry tales, the supping and the dancing. Goodman Maggot there, there for all his belt was prancing. Tom did a hornpipe when he was not quaffing. Daughters did the springle ring, good wife did the laughing. Okay, uh, this is a merry meeting at Bam Furlong, right? Uh, this is clearly a general festival. Notice that uh, uh, Farmer Maggot himself is prancing, right, for all his belt, meaning Farmer Maggot is kind of stout around the middle, right? So he has a lot of belt. And despite his quantity of belt, he's prancing around, uh, doing some prancing around uh, himself. Exactly, Tim. Cock, uh, cock shut time means when you shut the chicken up, the, the chickens in, the, in, the, in the, the, the chicken coop for the night. Exactly. So it's after sundown. Um, uh, I love the fact that we get this recapitulation of uh, Farmer Maggot's journey to the, uh, uh, to, the, to the ferry, right, after dark but in this completely different context, meeting Tom Bombadil and having this sort of riotous talk uh, as they as they come, you know, laughing all the way, passing by the inn because they're going to, to Farmer Maggot's house, right? And at Farmer Maggot's, you see his kids are all turned out, right? His son's bowing at the door and his daughter's curtsying and his uh, Farmer Maggot's wife bringing out beer to them. Uh, obviously, again, you can see this trend. All of the, the sort of harsh talk and insults and things are clearly... Uh, are clearly there at hand, right? Um, and uh, you know that they're, 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 they're clearly not intended. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, cool. I love this description. I love the description of Farmer Maggot's house and the Fellowship of the Ring. I love this description of this holiday at Farmer Maggot's house, right? And, and it's a spontaneous holiday. The indications are Tom himself didn't know he was going here. The Wren assumed that he was, and Tom says, oh, okay, I'll go along and do that. Maybe he was planning to all along anyway. I don't know. Um, but when the Wren flies off and says, I'll tell him that you're coming, Farmer Maggot, obviously, um, then he's like, okay, I'll go. So Farmer Maggot has just had a, wren, a willow wren fly to his ear and tell him that Tom Bombadil is coming tonight and the whole farm is on holiday that evening, right? Um, uh, that's, uh, that's just a really cool image. Um, and by the way, the insults are pretty awesome, right? Uh, Pennywise tub on legs is uh, my favorite. Again, uh, Farmer Maggot has a lot of belt, right? When others went to bed in hay, fern, or heather, or feather, close in the ingle nook they laid their heads together, old Tom and muddy feet, swapping all the tidings, from barrow downs to tower hills of walkings and of ridings, of wheat ear and barley corn, of sowing and of reaping, queer tales from Bree and talk at smithy, mill, and cheaping. Rumors in whispering trees, south wind in the larches, tall watchers by the forge, shadows on the marches. Old Maggot slept at last in chair beside the embers. Ere dawn, Tom was gone, as dreams one half remembers. Some merry, some sad, some of hidden warning. None heard the door unlocked, a shower of rain at morning. His footprints washed away, at Mythe left no traces. At Hay's end they heard no song, nor sound of heavy paces. Three days his boat lay by the high that grinned wall, and then one morn was gone back up with a window. Otter folk, Hobbit said, came by night and loosened her, dragged her over weir, and upstream they pushed her. Yeah, yeah. Um, I love these stories. And yes, Stephanie, this also reminds me of the description of his stories to the Hobbits. But you notice how it's mutual, how it goes both ways, right? We can kind of tell who's telling which 
tails, right? Uh, uh, as they're as they're swapping uh, tidings with each other, right? We know who tells the stories from the Barrow Downs and Tower Hills and queer tales from Bree, right? Whereas the talk at the smithy mill in Cheaping almost certainly comes from Farmer Maggot, right? And the rumors in Whispering Trees and South Wind in the Larches, that's got to be from Tom, right? So I, I, I'm fascinated by the different kinds of news that they are exchanging. Tall Watchers by the Ford. What does that mean? Tall Watchers by the Ford. Shadows on the, marsh, on the marches. Tall Watchers by the Ford. This, I think, also tells us the time frame, right? Who are the tall watchers by the ford, do you think? Probably Sarnford, I assume, is what he means, the, uh, the ford in the, in the Withywindle. Who would the tall watchers be? Anybody? Marianne, I, I agree. They would be the rangers, right? Um, the watcher, yeah, the tall watchers are the rangers. Good, exactly. Tug McGill is saying the same thing. Yeah, the rangers. So when is this? When would there be rangers watching by the... I think it's very clear this is not prior to the Lord of the Rings, right? I mean, theoretically, it's possible. We know that he hangs out with Maggot. He mentions that, right? The thing that makes me think this really cannot be understood as being prior to the Lord of the Rings is the familiarity of the hobbits down at Hayes End with Tom Bombadil. Right? If they were that familiar with Tom Bombadil, Mary would have heard of him. Right? Mary wouldn't be so, you know, unclear. Mary would mention it presumably when they're going into the old forest. I can't. I I I read this as Tom becoming more openly acquainted with the hobbits afterwards. Right after his meeting with Frodo and uh, Mary and Pippin and Sam. Um, so. Yes, exactly, uh, uh, Sarah. The guard that Aragorn put around the Shire. Absolutely. Uh, remember when they get back to Bree, uh, uh, in the fellowship, in the Return of the King, rather, right? Um, the Gandalf says the Rangers have returned. Right, we came with them. So the Rangers went away. Right, they went into the you know the the ride of the Grey Company. But now afterwards, the Rangers are back. Right, and we know that Aragorn is going to place a watch around the Shire um, uh, afterwards. So. Um, uh, so yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's I, I so I, I think that we can see this is in the time, but it's in fact we, we we have a fairly narrow time range, right? It's after the return of the king, but it's before Aragorn has returned up into the north, right, to reestablish the North Kingdom because of the Swan, right? Remember the king hasn't come back yet, uh, and Tom is still threatening that. Um, Tom Hillman is noting that he does leave his country. It is interesting, isn't it? Um, yeah. Um, and one wonders, it's hard to imagine, Tom, that he's changing his policies at this point, right? So what does that mean? What does that imply about Tom and his relationship with his boundaries, right? I don't really know. I'm not really sure. Um, do his boundaries include the Shire? Is there some sense, Tom, in which that could be one of the, th you know, it's like like one of the things that Gildor is talking about when Gildor says, but it's not your Shire, right? Um, uh, yeah. I mean, Tom Bombadil comes there. That it seems to be within Tom Bombadil's, certainly, obviously, within the the radius he will come, right? Um, yeah, yeah, JJ, that's kind of the kind of thing that I was I was thinking about. All right, um, last stanza, and then we're done. Eighteen slides worth of poetry. Out of Elvet Isle, old swan came calling. In beak took her painter up in the water trailing. Drew her proudly on, otters swam beside her. The king's fisher perched on bow, on thwart the wren was singing. Merrily the cockle boat homeward they were bringing. To Tom's Creek they came at last. Otter lad said, Whish now, what coot without his legs or a finless fish now? O oh, silly sallow willow stream, the oars they'd left behind them. Long they lay at Grindwall Hythe for Tom to come and find them. So, uh, they, you know, they, they brought his boat back, but they left the oars behind. And so there his oars remain uh, at Grindwall Hythe uh, for a long time until Tom returns again to get them. Um, Notice, of course, all of his animal friends bring his boat back home. We can see sort of, you know, like the harmony and friendship here uh, at the end. Uh, the swan towing the boat, Phil, does have some really interesting resonance, right, with early Legendarium, though in this very 
very domestic, very friendly, very local neighborhood kind of environment, right? But you can't, uh, you can't totally lose uh, those uh, those memories, those memories of Galadriel and the memories of Valinor uh, uh, before it, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Cass asks, is this why he had to carve new oars at the beginning of the poem? Yeah, does this happen all the time, Cass? Right? Yeah, it's a good question, right? All right, excellent. Um, very, okay, so we're out of time. Uh, I can't uh, dilate any further on these last stanzas as it is time for our next segment. So I'm going to say thank you uh, to the folks on Twitter. I will catch up with you guys again. I'll do another segment uh, on Twitter later on in the day. Um, but again, do, please join us for the rest of the day. We're going to be talking. We're going to do a, a spotlight on a couple fun programs. Now we're going to talk about our graduate program uh, a little bit and, uh, and share with some of... Um, uh, with some of our, 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 our faculty and students uh, and talk about what we do in the MA program uh, for, the next, uh, for the next little while. And then after that, we're going to introduce a brand new program that we're starting at Mythgard here in this coming year. Uh, so join us, twitch.tv slash SignumU for the rest of the day. Thanks very much, Twitter folks. The Mythgard Academy has been offering in-depth discussions of awesome books and films since 2013, completely free to attend and free to download. If you've enjoyed our discussions and would like to help them continue, please consider donating at signumuniversity.org fund.